Okay, g'day all and welcome to another video. So today what I wanted to do was uh, something completely different. Uh, I want to program one of these little fellas, a PEC microcontroller. What we're going to do today is just take a kind of crash course, go into the assembly language, as well as how to set up your IDE. And then later on, I wanted to add uh, other videos, sort of going into things a bit more detail and going into some of the other interesting aspects of PEC microcontrollers. Because I tell you what, these little things are so, so much fun to program. The device that I've got just here is a PEC 12F675, a mid-range little uh, MCU microcontroller. It's actually pretty capable. Yeah, it's only got um, eight little legs on it. Yeah, so it's, it's really interesting to just let your imagination go wild and uh, think about the things that you could program with these little devices. Uh, they're sort of a step below uh, something like the Arduino or the Raspberry Pi because they don't have like a bootloader or anything like that. So today we're going to program this little uh, 12F675 and I'll get a breadboard out and I'll be um, lighting up an LED at the end. But we'll sort of go through how you can use a simulator on your computer to just um, yeah have a bit of a look and see that it's working anyway, even if you don't have a uh, an actual pick. The other thing that I wanted to say is if you don't have a 12F675, if you've got something else, you can you can more or less follow along with the tutorial. But certain things will change. Some of the register names might be different. You might be talking about Tris IO instead of just a Tris register. And uh, the pins will certainly be different. So you might be able to follow along with this tutorial with your own chip if you're not interested in coding this particular chip. But you will probably need your data sheet handy. Yeah. Okay, so the things that you will need, you will need a chip. Yeah, I'm using uh, the 12F675 just here. Great little chip. You'll also need a breadboard. Wait a second. If you're not using a software simulator, you need a breadboard. Uh, you'll need some way to power your chip. So I'm going to use this little uh, breakout uh, cable that I've just kind of taken from a, from a USB cable. You could also use um, an Arduino as well. So five volts or three volts will do it too. Three volts and ground is the only two pins that you need from your Arduino if you want to power your chip like that. A couple more jumper cables here. Yeah, that's just to connect my power up. You will need a resistor. A resistor just, um, just for your LED. You don't want to put uh, five volts without a resistor through an LED or it'll just, it'll blow up really. Yeah, they stop working pretty quick. And then we need an LED. I chose a green LED because this is particularly bright. And the next thing that you'll need is a way to actually program it. So I've got what's called a universal programmer. Uh, this is by a company called XGecko. You can also get uh, the uh, pick kit or the pick kit. And I believe that uh, if you use the pick kit, then you mightn't have some of the trouble that we have uh, with these universal programmers. Yeah, so this uh, device here is not specifically designed for PIC microcontrollers. Uh, it's universal, programs a whole bunch of uh, different devices. These things are great. They're, they're really, really good fun. You can program sort of old Atmels or like Fairchild semiconductors. You can program just about every uh, microcontroller on the planet with one of these. Absolutely brilliant. But that is just about it in terms of hardware. So let's have a bit of a look at the software, shall we? Uh, what you're going to need, if we come over here to um, Firefox or whatever uh, web browser you happen to be using, they make uh, an IDE, Integrated Development uh, Environment, and it's called MPLabX. So if you just Google that, you'll find uh, MPLabX IDE. We will be programming the modern uh, assembly, which is called PICAS or P-I-C-A-S. There was uh, a, a while back, I can't remember when they changed this, maybe one or two years ago, there was another assembly language, which was called, I think, MPASM. Yeah, but MPASM is now a uh, legacy, and the modern IDEs that we'll be using don't actually support uh, MPASM. So we will be programming the modern uh, version, which is PICAS. Okay, so if you have a bit of a look at this page, you should be able to find the downloads there. View the latest downloads. Let's click on that. Yeah, there you go. So you'll find an appropriate download there for your particular operating system. So the other thing that you might have to do is uh, install a compiler. See, it's been a while since I installed uh, MPLab X, but um, what would it be called? Uh, XC8, I think. The compiler that we're going to be using is pick as, or the assembler that we're going to be using is pick as. I think it comes with the um, XC8 compiler. Yeah. At any rate, you might have to install the 8-bit C 
compilers. And if you're using a universal programmer, like I'm using just here, this little XGeku thing, then you'll also need XG Pro, which is the software that will actually let us take uh, the, the hex file or, or the compiled uh, file, the assembled file, and uh, put it onto our device. Yeah, we'll see all of that at the end. In terms of uh, information, whenever you're programming these little devices, you pretty much, uh, you need to get the data sheet. So the data sheet for this particular device is this one just here, PEC 12F629 slash 675. So we would say something like um, 12F675 data sheet. Hit enter, and if we just scroll down a little bit, you should find a microchip. Uh, you should find a microchip PDF, which will give you the information that you're after. There it is there. So that would be how I get the data sheet for that particular device. Uh, there is another couple of things that you're going to want. So microchip mid-range uh, device, like PDF. You're going to want this particular manual just here. So the mid-range MCU family reference manual actually contains a whole heap of really, really good information. If something is not clear in the data sheet for your particular device, then uh, check this one. Yeah, the mid-range device. Uh, you'll also want this one just here. So this is the assembler user's guide, which explains a whole heap of uh, things just to do with the assembler itself. Yeah, so not necessarily specific to hardware, but just how the uh, assembler and the assembly language itself works. There's also a migration guide, which is written for people coming from um, MP Assam over to this uh, new uh, PIC as. Uh, but um, if you're new to microchip uh, microcontroller programming, uh, I'd recommend that you just start out with this um, new assembler. Yeah, so download all of those documents, get the hardware ready if you want to give this a shot in uh, hardware and uh, download the software and we should be ready to start. Okay, so when MPLAB opens up, uh, what you want to do is file and then new project. Microchip embedded is the first one, so we'll just click next. Then in your device, you want to find whatever device you're programming. So like I said, you could probably follow along with this tutorial with uh, other mid-range devices or some of the baseline devices, but things will change a little. Anyway, we're programming the 16F or the 12F675. That's it just there. And for the tool, if you just click that little drop down box, you should see simulator. The simulator really, really helps for debugging. Yeah, because you can uh, step through code and have a look at the registers as they change and things like that. If you don't actually have a device to program, then you can still play around with this stuff. You can still learn how to program them. Anyway, we select the simulator and we click next. Uh, support a debug header. Good, that's great. Just click next. Down here in compiler tool chains. So if you haven't got a uh, pick as down the bottom there, then that means that you have to install the uh, assembler. Uh, if a lot of people have trouble doing that, then I can get a, a virtual machine or something and I can run through the um, installation of the compilers. Yeah, but we'll just see how we go. So pick as is the one that we want. We're programming in assembly language. So we click next. Now uh, we've got to give our project a name. So I might just call it uh, blinking LED since that's what it's going to do. And we click finish. Okay, and then we get all of this nice stuff. I'll just close this uh, startup page just here and we come over here to our um, little project and we'll right click on source files. We'll say new and then assembly file dot assum. And for our file name, we might just say main dot assum. And then click finish. We're just about to start programming this little device. One of the things that you've got to do is uh, there's a whole heap of uh, configuration bits. The configuration bits actually set a whole bunch of different options. I can't see the configuration bits down the bottom just here. So what I have to do is go up into window and down here to target memory views and down here to configuration bits. Whenever I'm uh, using a window down the bottom here, if you can't see that window on your IDE at home, then what you want to do is um, open up the window using this um, little file menu and windows and target memory views. Configuration bits is the one that we want. This will just give us an easy way to type the code to actually set the configuration bits. These are the configuration bits down the bottom here. For the oscillator, we want an internal oscillator. So you can use an external oscillator or a resistor and a capacitor. That's really good fun. We can have a bit of a play around with that at some point in the future. 
what do we want here? An internal oscillator, internal oscillator, IO function on GP4, IO function on GP5. Yes, that's the one. That's an internal oscillator, so it doesn't need any uh, external clock. It doesn't need any capacitor or resistor setup. Just using its internal oscillator. For the watchdog, we'll turn him off. So the watchdog would normally um, reset the device every few uh, milliseconds, I think. It's, it resets it a lot. GP3, we want to be IO, so we can turn MCLRE off. The brownout detection, we can turn that off, and everything else is off. Once you've set the bits that you want, you want to click Generate Source Code to Output and it's gonna write you the source code. So we just select that and we copy and then control V to paste. Okay, so I might just um, shift tab these back one space. That should just about be it. xc.inc is uh, a header that includes a whole bunch of names for the registers. So these devices, just like a regular CPU, they have uh, um, an internal memory, which is called uh, registers. But uh, unlike uh, programming x86, the registers in these little devices are just numbered. Yeah, so you just kind of use their addresses to reference them like 20H, uh, 21H or 50H or whatever. That can become really, really confusing. So a, a better way to address the registers is by using uh, equates or by naming them. Yeah, so we'll, we'll have a bit of a look at that in just a second. xc.inc actually names a whole bunch of registers for us. Before your XC8, just define your processor with this little directive, processor 12F675, or whatever processor you're using. Okay, moving on. So we've got all of those config bits out of the way. What we've got to do now is psect. psect, or program section. Everything in uh, pick as is defined in uh, program sections. And you've got things for uh, program sections for data. You've got other program sections for code. Uh, with these little devices, you don't tend to have any uh, extra data anyway, so we'll just be using code PSEC today. The first PSEC is very special. I'm going to call it reset vect, and it's class equals code, and it's delta equals two. So with the um, mid-range devices, and I think the baseline devices as well, the delta or the instruction size is two, so you have to specify that. Uh, I think for other devices, you don't have to specify that delta, but for us, because we're using a mid-range device, 12F675, we do have to specify delta. There's a whole lot of different options that you can provide for these PSECs. Um, things like, uh, what is it? Uh, overlaid and relock will let you uh, actually position the exact place in program memory where you want your code to be. That can become important uh, but it's it's tricky and it's fiddly, so we'll just do it. Uh, we'll just do it the quick way today. But let's see. Reset vect. Uh, I'm gonna say page cell main. Go to main. Okay. So what have we got just here? What is all of this nonsense? Psect. Psect. Reset vect. The next line down here. Reset vect. This is a label. Yeah, just somewhere for the CPU or the MCU, sorry, to reference just so that we can jump to it using its name. Page cell main. Page cell is a pseudo instruction. And what that's going to do is uh, select the page in program memory that main, the main label is in. Yeah, just so that when we do this uh, go to main just here, we are sure that we've actually got the right page. Uh, I don't think for this particular program that page cell main is actually necessary, but yeah, that's what it is. Reset vect or the reset vector is uh, very common, uh, very commonly used in uh, programming these little microcontrollers. What it is, is it's the start of the code. It's where the device goes to when, uh, when it's reset. And you might be wondering, well, why don't you just start programming in the reset vector? Why don't we just write our program here and make our LED go on and off? And the reason is that the reset vector has to be at uh, code position zero. It has to be at address number zero, so at the very start of the program memory. And straight after that, at I think it's address four for these particular devices, there's a, a, another point in the code memory called the interrupt vector. We won't be using interrupts today, but we can't program uh, over the interrupt vector, or we shouldn't program over the interrupt vector. So what you usually do is you program your reset vector, and it's only got four bytes before the interrupt vector starts. So it's got to be very, very small, whatever it is. You program your reset vector to do 
nothing other than just jump to main, jump over the interrupt uh, vector, which we're not going to have today, but jump over the interrupt vector and start executing main. Before we go on, we actually have to specify to the uh, linker that reset vect, this little label just here, and this uh, psect, we have to specify to the linker that that is uh, actually the reset vector. So what you do, you come over here to options, or project properties, sorry. Yeah, a little screwdriver with some bolts and things. If we just click on that, we should get the uh, project properties. If you come down here to pick as linker, if you come over here to custom linker options, click the dot, dot, dot. We want to add another little option just here. And the one that we want to add is dash P for, I think, program section. And we want to say reset vect or the name of our psect. And then we want to say equals OXO or equals zero. Yeah, zero will do. What we're doing just there is specifying the uh, actual address that we want this psect to be at. Yeah, this is just one way of specifying the address where you want your PSEC to uh, actually be inside the device's program memory. Um, there are other ways using, um, I think it's relock and overlaid, and then you can use um, org. Anyway, we can talk about all of that a different time, but for the moment we just go OK, and then apply. OK. Things are going to get a little bit complicated. We're going to make another PSEC. This one's just called code. So one of the things that uh, xc.inc defines is a whole bunch of useful uh, shortcuts for defining your psects. And one of them is, uh, is code. Yeah, so we can just do psect code. I think you might have to do delta equals two, even for code psect uh, for these little devices. But now we'll define our main. There he is. And we might say something like uh, go to, whoops go to main something like that and then down the bottom we'll say end reset vect um, yeah so we've got another label that's the main label that we referenced before in our reset vect and our main does nothing but go to main so it's just going to be a, a, a loop yeah as soon as it gets to main it's going to go back to main it's going to go back to main it's going to go back to main but then after that we've got uh, this end directive just here the end directive you get to specify uh, one label and that label that you specify there is the reset vector. You don't actually have to use the same names I've used just here. You can say like resvec or whatever you want. Yeah, but reset vect, something along those lines is, uh, is generally what you do. I think all is looking pretty well. What we might do is, uh, is just, do a bit of a, just do a bit of a run, shall we? So if you have a look up here, you should see a play button, debug main project. We just put a break point right there by clicking in the margin. We should be able to run and hopefully the program will uh, compile OK. And we'll be on our little reset vect. Yeah, there we go. So at the moment, the program has compiled OK and it's run fine and it's stopped just here at main. So if we hit uh, F7, which is uh, jump into. Uh, or you can look up here, there's little icons for it. Step over, step into, step out. Yeah, I'll hit F7. We jump down to our little main just here. And we'll just keep hitting F8. It seems to be running A-OK. -okay. We're going to have to have a bit of a look at the data sheet now. What we want to do is turn an LED on and off. We want to get one of the digital pins. So I'm going to use uh, GPIO zero or general purpose input output zero, which is just a pin on the device. Where did I put it? Uh, GPIO zero is the second pin on the uh, right hand side. We want that to turn on and off or go high and then low, because that means if we connect our little LED to that pin, then when it goes high, the LED will turn on. And then when the uh, pin goes low or zero volts, our little LED will go off. When you turn these little logic pins on and off, they actually go to five volts and zero volts, and then five volts and then zero volts. The way that uh, we control GPIO pins inside these little devices is with a register called GPIO. Yeah, so GPIO just means general purpose input output. Um, the pins themselves are presented to us as just a register. In order to actually turn the pin on and off, we have to set the GPIO pin to O or output. Yeah, we don't want to get uh, input. It's not a button. What we want to do is uh, send output. Yeah, we want to turn an LED on and off. There's a couple of things that we've got to do in order to, in order to achieve that. We've got to change the TRIS IO register, the tri-state register to specify that pin zero, which would be the one that we'll be using. We've got to specify that pin zero is an output. 
So Tress IO is used to specify which pins of your GPIO or your little device, uh, which pins are inputs and which pins are outputs. And the other thing that we've got to do, we've got to turn the comparator off and we've also got to turn the, uh, what is it, analog to digital converter off. And I tell you what, I can never for the life of me remember uh, what they are called. I can remember what they're called, it's like um, Ansel. If you come to the data sheet and you just do a bit of a search, you'll see, uh, so the comparator is like CMCON or something and the other one is uh, Ansel, but uh, GPIO, if you just do a search for GPIO, and uh, just click on GP port. Uh, okay, so if you come down here to the uh, data sheet, it's on uh, page 21 on this particular version that I'm looking at. You'll see over the side just here, there's a little box with pretty much the exact information that we want. This is the code to turn the uh, comparator off, to turn uh, the analog converter off, GPIO pins to whatever you want. Uh, okay, so that's what the code does just there. So let's have a bit of a look at coding that. I'll just shift this down a little bit so I can see that code while we're going. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll just talk about the code as we go. So BCF. Uh, BCF is um, uh, bit clear F, the file register. So the, the, the memory where all of the registers are stored this is both the special purpose registers and the general purpose registers, which we'll see in just a second. Uh, it's called the file register, and it's kind of just the RAM of the device. Yeah, it sort of acts as both the RAM and the registers for the device. BCF is bit clear F, or bit clear, one of the registers. And we type the register name is status and uh, RP0. So I'm just going to put a 5 there because uh, I haven't got RP0 defined. Maybe at some point we should have a bit of a look at all of these registers. Hold on a second. If you come here to memory organization, I should have done this before. If you come here to memory organization, you'll see a list of all of the registers. Timers, the PCL, which is the program counter. Uh, GPIO is just there. FSR, that's used for indirect addressing. Intcon, the interrupt control register. Yeah, a whole heap of different registers. And down the bottom, after those registers, you'll see that there's actually data here. Um, for general purpose. So the general purpose registers are our RAM. Yeah, that's what we use in our program as variables. Now, anyway, what you'll see there is that there's actually two uh, columns. Yeah, there's two banks in this device. The first is bank zero, and the second one is bank one. And you see a whole heap of registers over there. Whenever you wanna change something in bank zero, you have to be sure that you're actually in bank zero. The general purpose registers are the same in both banks. Yeah, so regardless of whether you're in bank zero or one, if you change um, the general purpose registers, um, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. And for some of the other registers, it's the same too. So you look at the status register or FSR. Yeah, a whole bunch of these uh, special purpose registers are available in both banks as well. But some of them, GPIO and TRIS-IO, you have to be in the right bank. And the way that we change the bank is bit five of status. Yeah, so I think for other devices, if there's more banks, then you've actually got a couple more bits in uh, status to change, but for us, it's just bit five. If bit five of status is zero, then we are in bank zero. And if bit five of status is one, then we are in bank one. What I would suggest you do is uh, always, after you've changed something in uh, bank one, change back to bank zero. Yeah, just, just default to bank zero just so that you're not confused. Uh, anyway, that's um, yeah the register file and banks. Uh, let's go back to where we were, GPIO. That first line just there, that first line just there, BCF status five means bit clear, bit five of the status register. Make sure that we're in bank uh, zero. Yeah, we wanna be in bank zero because we're just about to CLRF GPIO. Um, okay, so I'm going to put an F there as well at the end. So CLRF means uh, clear, a file register, and then you supply the register that you want, which is GPIO, and then I've put a comma and F after that. So what you'll find is that a lot of instructions you can either write to W, the working register, or WREG, or you can write to F, the file register. We should see this again and again and again. It's recommended that whichever one you're writing to, you put at the end of each statement. So comma F or comma W. Yeah, even if you, even, even if you think it's obvious, 
Uh, it just helps make your code a little bit more readable. CLRF GPIO comma F is just gonna clear the GPIO register and it's not gonna save the result to the W register. It's gonna save it to F or GPIO itself. Yeah, if we had a W just here, what that would mean is um, clear GPIO or set it to zero, but save the result or that zero, save that result to the W reg, yeah, the working register. Anyway, that instruction just there just sets your um, GPIO, all of the input and output pins to zero. MOV LW. MOV LW is move a literal into the W register and you just supply the literal. So here they've got uh, OX7. Seven is one, one, one in, uh, in binary. And 111 happens to be a special value. Let's just, um, CMCON is the comparator control register. And uh, there's a whole bunch of different options for the comparator. The comparator is cool. This, this thing, this is good fun, but we can talk about that another time. 111 or this seven just here, is a comparator control setting that means turn the comparator off. Yeah, we don't want to use a comparator, so we've, we've chosen uh, seven. Uh, if you look in the data sheet, you'll see the all of the options for the comparator. Anyway, seven is the one that we're using. Uh, MOV WF uh, means move the working register value into F or CM CON in this instance. You can't move straight from a literal into one of the file registers. Yeah, the, the only register that you can move a literal into is actually the W register, working reg. If you wanna move a literal into a register, say this seven into CMCON, the first thing that you gotta do is move it into the W reg with MOV LW, and then you can move it into your other register, your file register using MOV WF. The next instruction, BSF status RP0. So I'm gonna use uh, BSF status and bit set. F. Uh, we're setting bit five of the status register. In other words, we're setting it to one. In other words, we're changing to bank one. Yeah, so we wanna change to bank one. Ansel is in um, bank one. Yeah, so we also wanna turn off the analog to digital converter, CLRF. Turn him off. Off you go, Ansel, clear Ansel. What's the next thing that we gotta do? MOV LWOCH. So the, the next thing that we gotta do is change the TRIS IO register. So this is where we specify which pins of the device will be inputs or, or buttons, in other words, that we can press and which pins will be outputs. So if you want an input, you set the uh, corresponding bit of the pin to a one. And if you want an output, then you set that bit to zero. So for us, we actually want um, just outputs. So what we can do is just clear the TRIS IO or we could do um, MOV LW uh, zero, just move the literal zero into our working register and then MOV WF uh, TRIS IO. F, yeah, you don't really need an F there. Set um, zero, I could actually do this, I think. Yeah, like that. So if we wanted pin this pin here to be an input, then we just change that to a one, yeah. Uh, but as it happens, we don't, so I might just, um, Set it back to a zero. All right, we're just gonna be using pin zero at the moment, this one here on the end, yeah. Okay, but that is pretty much the uh, the end of it all. What I do what I do wanna do is um, just make sure that we're in um, bank zero after all that. So I'll BCF or, or clear that status bit again. And uh, then we can actually start our loop of turning our LED on and off. So I might just say loop head, I'll call it. And I might change this go to down here to go to loop head. Let me just hit save. Okay, I am gonna run this and make sure that it's all going okay so far. And while we run it, I might just have a bit of a chat about uh, how to get some of these windows open. Uh, okay, so it seems to be going fine so far. So if you, if you can't see it down the bottom there, you can open up the registers window. Just go up to windows and target memory views. Uh, you should see SFRs is a good one. Good little window to open. So that's gonna show you the current value of each of your special function registers. Yeah, so the special function registers are all of these weird and wacky names that we've been changing. Yeah, that just lists them all there. So you can see at the top there, WREG, good old WREG. PCL is the program counter or the uh, instruction pointer. Status, we know about GPIO, 
as we step through this, let's just have a bit of a look. So status is cleared to zero. Uh, GPIO is cleared to zero, it was already zero. This MOV LW line just here, as I step over this, you'll see that W reg at the top there has changed to seven. Let's just keep stepping through and see how we go. Okay, I think it's pretty good. So it all compiled fine and it got through there. We'll put in a couple of little lines here. We'll say uh, BCF uh, GPIO zero and then BSF GPIO uh, zero. This is essentially the lines here that we want. We want to clear bit zero of the GPIO. In other words, we want to set that little pin there to zero volts. And then we want to set that pin to five volts. So zero volts, five volts, zero volts, five volts. What this is gonna do is turn our LED on and off. But if I just put a bit of a break point right here, uh, I do wanna run this program and see if it's actually turning the GPIO on and off. Uh, so if we come down here to GPIO just here, little GPIO register. Uh, at the moment, the GPIO register is zero. If we step over this line, it's still zero because that was a bit clear. If we step over the next line, you see it changed to one. And as we keep going around our loop, you see the GPIO first bit there turning on and off. Well, that's good. So what that would mean, uh, at least in theory, is if we attached our little uh, device up with this code here on it, and uh, we put an LED in our little resistor coming off that uh, pin there, pin zero, that LED would be turning on and off. But there's a bit of a problem. The internal clock that we chose for this device actually runs at four megahertz or four million cycles per second. And uh, each instruction actually takes four clock cycles. So these two little BCF and BSF instructions are gonna be going past so, so fast. It's gonna take about you know, one five hundredth of a second before the LED turns on and off again. <laughs> and what would happen if we actually plugged our little LED into this and we kind of put it on our little microcontroller? Probably what would happen was uh, our, our LED would just, uh, it would shine, probably. Uh, it would just look very dim. Yeah, you wouldn't actually see it flashing because it's too fast. What we have to do is put in a delay. And if I just shift this down a little bit, we're gonna be talking about delays. So this is probably where this is gonna get the most complicated. Before we talk about delays, let's just open up another window. So we'll open up the file registers window. Uh, this is actually a list of all of the file register, the entire file register. And it contains both the special function registers. So that's those top uh, couple of lines there with the blue and the gray. And it's also these ones down here from uh, address 60. Uh, but it also contains um, the variables that we can use or the general purpose registers. The general purpose registers start at 20H. So it starts there and they go all the way through to there. Yeah, 5F. Those uh, bytes just there are registers that we can use uh, for whatever we want. Each of those registers is, is one byte each. They're exactly uh, eight bits. And uh, 8 bits is not especially useful for what we're doing here today. We want to cause a delay. We want our LED to turn on and then off again with some sort of uh, noticeable delay. If it's turning on and off a million times a second, I mean, we can't see that. We want some sort of a delay. If we use one byte, we could start our byte at 255, say, and then for our delay, we could count down all the way to zero. We could do that. But the trouble is that that would still be too fast. Even if we asked our little microcontroller to count down from 255 to zero, it would still be too fast. So what we've got to do is figure out a way to use something larger or, or a variable type larger than just a single byte. And the way that we can do this uh, with these little microcontrollers is just to use a couple of bytes. So what we're going to do now is use um, EQU or equates to define something like a, a variable. But we're going to define a 32-bit uh, integer. So I might call it like um, delay reg or just delay zero, I guess. Uh, EQU and 20H. I'm going to go OX20 actually. Right there, all I've done is I've said, I want to refer to the register at address number OX20 or 20 in hexadecimal. I want to refer to that as delay zero. Yeah, so you'll quickly find that pretty much all of the variables that you use when you're programming these um, picks 
you pretty much want to do a, an EQU or an equates there so that you can use some sort of symbolic name like delay just here. And the reason why I've called it delay zero is because we actually want a whole heap more of them, EQU OX21. So I'm going to call delay zero is um, the uh, this one just here in, in our little user memory. And delay one is the byte beside it. Let's keep going, shall we? Uh, delay two, EQU OX22. And then the last one that we want for 32 bits, delay uh, three, EQU OX23. Uh, okay, so that's just kind of floating around in the middle of nowhere. Maybe I should put a bit of a comment up here. All we've done just there is uh, named a whole bunch of our little registers, these four little registers just here. Yeah, starting from 28 and going all the way through to 23.8. And we're just about to use them as a 32-bit variable to cause our amazing delay. What we want to do is be able to easily move a number into those uh, four bytes as though they were a 32-bit uh, variable. Yeah, so a lot of the coding that you'll do with these picks is about kind of making things more flexible and, and easier for yourself as a programmer, uh, such as those equates that we just did then. What we'll do just here is make a macro or a, a pseudo instruction. We'll kind of make our own pseudo instruction and we're going to make it so that our macro takes any number, any 32-bit number, and it stores it in our four little um, delay variables just here, as though this uh, little device can deal with 32-bit integers. My macro, I'll just call it mov uh, 32l for move a 32-bit literal. Uh, it's a macro and it's going to take a destination register. It's also going to take an immediate 32. My camera died, but she's all charged up again. So let's have a let's have a look. What were we doing? Where were we at? We were making a macro to move 32 bits of data into our little um, delay registers just there, just to make life a bit easier. You would say mov LW or move a literal into L into the uh, W register, the working register, and the literal is IMM32 that way zero and OXFF. Move in each of the different bytes of the 32-bit immediate into the different registers. So delay zero has the first byte of this immediate 32-bit value. Then delay one will have the second byte and etc. etc. This would be how you move the first byte into the W register. Once again, you can't move literals into any other register other than the W register. So we have to move it into W first and then we can move WF uh, dest plus zero and we're saving to F. I've put all of these zeros in here, this shift zero and this um, dest plus zero, just so that we can make this bit a bit quicker. Uh, if I just copy and paste that. So for the other bytes, for the other, uh, the upper three bytes, we just have to change these values here a little bit. So for the second byte, we wanna shift our immediate value eight bits to the right and then end with uh, OXFF. Interesting that the immediate values that you use in macros, I think they can be big nums. They can be pretty much anything. Yeah, you, know, you can go up to 64 or 128 bits and uh, program your little macros just here. Dest plus one. Okay, so when you reference these uh, file registers, you can actually use little uh, operations. So if we do something like this, so we go mov uh, wf ox20. That 20 just there doesn't mean move 20 into the working register. That means move from the working register into file register number 20. Yeah, so you can also do uh, operations here. So 20 plus one, that will be um, this register just here. Yeah, register number 21. So it does get really, really confusing referencing registers like that, which is why we use those equates so that we can reference names. Uh, but anyway, dest plus one, whatever operand they supply here is their destination register. That plus one is going to get the second byte just there because we shift it over and then and it with OXFF to get um, just a byte. I've used and just there, the word and as the Boolean op operator just to mask out any of the upper bits. Uh, you wouldn't have to do that. Yeah, you wouldn't have to do that at all. And they do say in the manual that you can use the operator the ampersand operator. Uh, but I've found that that doesn't work, so I stick with um, just and like that. For the next byte, it's gonna be shift the immediate value 16 bits to the right, and then and with OXFF, that's gonna be plus two. 
Move that into dest plus two. And then for the final byte of our little value, it's gonna be um, 24. Yeah, shift our immediate value 24 to the left to get that top byte and then end that with OXFF. That's not gonna do anything. Um, but then shift that into dest plus three. And then at the end, end M for end macro. What we've just defined there is a little macro to make our life a lot easier. Now what we can do, if we scroll down a bit to our, our little loop down here, BCF, so we're clearing the little LED. Before we turn it back on again, we wanna do a delay. So what I'll do, mov LW, mov, sorry, 32L, delay zero. So this is our macro that we're calling now. And the destination we want, or the very first byte of our four byte um, sort of pseudo register that we've made is uh, delay zero and the value that we wanna move. So we're gonna have a spin loop, which we'll code in just a second. And it's gonna count from some number all the way down to zero. And depending on how long it takes the little device to count that uh, little loop uh, will be our delay. The instructions that we're just about to use in our loop are actually a little bit slower than uh, a million times a second. They actually only run about, um, what would it be? About 333,000 times a second. Yeah, because there's more to the um, delay loop than just one instruction per iteration. In order to wait for about a second, if we do 333, 333, uh, 333, 333 should be a pretty good delay if we want our little uh, LED to turn on and off once every second. Yeah, so the whole cycle will take two seconds. Around about, and then we're gonna do call delay, and we'll hit save. I might just copy that down here as well. So we wanna put that delay in twice. Yeah, we want the delay when we turn the lamp, uh, the little LED on, and we also want the delay when we turn it off, so we put it there twice. And the next thing that we've got to do is actually write the function that delays. Yeah, and I'll do that underneath, uh, underneath our main function. So we'll just say um, delay. You just make a little label there if you want to make a function. The call instruction is just the same as on uh, other, uh, a normal uh, x86 CPU. Uh, I will say there's a big restriction on the depth that you can call to. So I think like the 10F200 has a depth of maybe two. Yeah, I know the uh, 12, what was my program? And 12C508 has a depth of two. This device here, I think has a depth of eight, which means that you can call a function that calls a function that calls a function that calls a function, etc. You can go uh, eight functions deep before you return. You don't have an unlimited stack in the same way that you do with um, a CPU. Anyway, this is, our, this is our delay. So at some point we're gonna return. Uh, so I'll just put that down the bottom. In order for this to work, we have to ink F each of the registers. Uh, we have to increment them all one. Um, we'll see in just a second. All right, so we'll increment each of our little delay registers. But the, the basis of this delay uh, loop is just gonna count down. So I'll just say delay loop like that. Uh, it's just gonna decrement the zeroth or the lowest byte. So decrement F, skip if zero, delay zero and save to F and then go to delay loop. What we've got here is a new instruction, deek F uh, S Z, which means uh, decrement one of the file registers and the, the register that we've supplied here is our delay zero or OX20 and uh, skip if zero. This is kind of how you do branches on these little devices. So if the result of decrementing delay zero, if the result of that decrement is zero, then this next instruction, go to delay loop, this will be skipped. Yeah, so if we start delay zero at like five, then it's gonna to go to four and uh, it won't skip. So it'll go down here, it'll go, go back to delay. Uh, then it'll run this deek F instruction again, it'll become three and then it won't be zero. So it'll go down here again. And uh, eventually this deek F Z uh, instruction, deek F S Z instruction will reach uh, zero. And at that point, it will skip uh, that go to just there. And when it does that, we wanna do F. Uh, at that point, we wanna decrement the next uh, byte in our multi-byte value. Yeah, we wanna decrement that one. 
and do the same thing again. What we've got just here is a little two byte counter. Yeah, so when that little first byte there reaches zero, then it'll jump down here to the second deke F S Z which decrements delay one. Whatever delay one is, that'll get decremented. And if that's not zero, it'll jump back up here to the delay loop. And here's something interesting happens. The, the next instruction after delay loop is deke F S Z again for delay zero. And what that's gonna do, if you remember, delay zero was zero. Um, yeah, before that instruction was hit because it had just skipped its little um, go to delay loop. So it must've been zero, but Right then, when we jump up here to the delay loop again, it's actually gonna decrement that uh, delay zero again from zero, and it's gonna wrap back around to 255. So what we've got just here is a two byte uh, counter. You can count down a 16 bit number. We don't end, we do another one. Deke F S Z, delay two, F go to uh, delay loop. Uh, once our two uh, lowest bytes have counted down to zero, we want to count down the third from lowest byte. And you guessed it, once that byte has finished, uh, delay three, F, go to delay loop. Just a kind of cascading bunch of these um, deke F, skip if zero little counters. But what we've managed to do is count down a 32-bit integer using our little 8-bit device. This is a 32-bit a delay counter. Uh, I think that's just about done. So if we just come up here and we put a breakpoint right there on that uh, MOV32L, actually I might put it here on the call delay. Uh, we'll run this and just have a bit of a test because I wanna show something else. This is the, uh, the stopwatch. Let's have a look. If we come over here to the stopwatch, if your stopwatch is not open, you can go up here to Windows, and what's it gonna be in debugging maybe? Yeah, debugging and stopwatch. Yeah, so you can open up your little stopwatch window. Uh, but when you've broken at a break point, you can hit uh, the little trash can just there to clear your stopwatch, and then the little uh, watch to reset it. And now what we should be able to do is jump over that delay. There you go, so we just executed the delay, the little, uh, the simulator just ran through this whole delay here and counted down our 32-bit uh, integer. And it says down here in the stopwatch window that that took uh, around about, around about one million uh, cycles. Yeah, which took just about one second. That's how you use the, uh, the stopwatch. Let's just hit a bit of a stop there. Everything seems to be going fairly well. What I want to do is come down here below the uh, delay function and I'm going to put in about about eight no operation instructions. And the reason I'm going to put those in because uh, I've noticed that I don't know if it's MP lab that's the problem uh, or if it's the programmer, but for some reason uh, the programmer tries to write uh, data to configuration bytes at the end of the chip and we don't want it to. Yeah, so you actually end up losing um, these final statements if you're not careful, like this return here and this final deke F, uh, skip if zero. You, you might lose those if you're not careful. Yeah, they don't actually get written to the chip. What I like to do is just put in a little buffer of no ops at the end. And again, I'm not sure if it's the programmer that I'm using, if the uh, pickets work much the same, I'm not 100% sure. But um, yeah, you might find that you have to put in a bunch of no ops at the end. At any rate, I think if we just um, production and clean build, let's see what happens. Okay, the clean build seems to work out fairly well. So we'll grab this little thing here. Now I'm gonna grab our little programmer and uh, I'll plug him in. Let's see, where's the... Uh... I might just move the camera actually so that you can see what I'm doing. Someone that's made 200 videos would have realized that first. <laughs> uh, I've just got my little, uh, my little pick in there. Now you kind of want it centered. And then this is a zip socket, so you just close that down like that. The next thing that we've got to do is open up our program. Where is it? Okay, so we'll come over here to XG Pro and I'll find the, uh, the actual program. So uh, MP Lab saves it. Uh, let's see, so we've got to go to the o uh, OS or the C drive. B users, Andromeda, just the name of my computer. 
uh, MPLAB X projects, blinking LED.x. We want to find the hex file. Yeah, the hex file. So we'll go to dist for distribution, default, production. And right there, you should see one of those files is called um, something, something, something dot production dot hex. So we'll double click on that and we'll click OK. And now our little uh, programmer program has loaded all of our code. Now uh, what you can see there, that very top little bit just there, that's our reset vector. Now uh, the machine code for that, 2BCD. Wow, if we scroll through, you'll just see a whole bunch of 3FFF. That means that we're not using very much code for this project. All the way down to the bottom and you should see a whole bunch of your um, data. Yeah, this is your actual program code. What you want to be careful of is you see this uh, 0008 just here. If we come back to MPLAB, that's actually the uh, machine code for this return here at the end of our delay. You want to make sure that that is in your program memory when you load it into your programmer. If you can't see that 0008, then you've done something wrong. Yeah, these are the no ops just here that I wrote. But you see these three FFFs at the end? Yeah, that's the sort of business there that it, uh, it the, the program or MP lab something tends to overwrite the last bytes of your program. Yeah, so just make sure you can see that triple zero eight instruction at the end there and you should be right. Anyway, we're, uh, we're ready to program our little device. He's all plugged in. So we'll hit prog and then we'll hit program. Off it goes doing a whole bunch of different little checks. And programming succeeded. Well done. All right, so back. And now the next thing that we got to do is actually plug it into our uh, breadboard. My breadboard is a bit of a mess. This is the only uh, it's the only breadboard I could get my hands on, but uh, it, it works okay. So we'll just have to do. Uh, but we'll take out our little chip from here. Uh, we'll take the, uh, the programmer away. So that's done. We'll plug our little chip in somewhere. Let's just put him here, shall we? There we go. He's in nice and snug. And I think... Uh, I think this pin up here on the top left, I think that's positive. Let me just check the data sheet. Yeah, you don't want to be making this stuff up. Oh, here we go. Uh, VDD. Yeah, top, top left is VDD and top right is VSS. And our pin is this one just here, GP0. Yeah, input output zero. What we'll do, we'll just put a red wire coming out of the positive. Oop. Just there like that. We'll put a black wire coming out of the negative, just like that. And we'll put a resistor. Uh, I'll put a resistor going from right there. Uh, so that resistor just there is coming out of pin seven, which is uh, GP zero. That's the bit that we're flicking on and off. And then once we go through our resistor, we should be right to put in our LED. So let me just get this uh, lined up properly. Uh, okay, so the LED, the positive leg has to go into the same place as the resistor and the negative leg can go to ground, which is the, um, the black wire just here. Let's plug in our power. So you could use an Arduino for this power if you wanted. Uh, we'll plug in our positive, oh, sorry, our negative, and then we'll plug in our positive. There you go. Would you look at that? Our little PIC microcontroller is just trooping along absolutely beautifully. What a beauty. Tiny little microcontroller is doing a million instructions per second. It's counting down from 333,333. It's lighting that little LED on and off by uh, switching its GPIO pin. Absolutely marvelous. Yeah, there we go. There we go. We've managed to turn an LED on and off and uh, it's really, really good fun. So this uh, little project just here is pretty much the, the first uh, project that you do with these little microcontrollers. It might seem kind of a little bit kind of pointless, uh, but this is really just scratching the surface. Um, these little things can do just amazing things, just amazing things. Yeah, you start getting into uh, the comparator and analog to digital conversion. Uh, you, you suddenly realize these things, uh, they are really, really good fun. Uh, yeah, I hope that was interesting to people and I want you to have a really good day. Thank you very much for watching.